knowing how strength conditioning works and how does the body operate here? How does the body move and do this? Mm -hmm. That is everything in our practice. Our whole practice is movement and strength conditioning. And the reason is because research screams that's what we should be doing. This is a revolution to fight for truth, fight for the people who trust us with their health, and a fight for research-backed action. This is a fight to purge baseless trends and customs in healthcare. This is a revolution to change the steps of healthcare from reactive medicine to preemptive medicine. Our vision is to be the catalyst for a system of proactive healthcare versus reactive healthcare. This is Impetus Health. Hey guys, and welcome to the Impetus Health Podcast. It is Ellie and Sean here, and today we are interviewing Sean about his company, Vulcan Performance Rehab and Recovery kind of how he got started and his background and his vision for the company. Let's do it. Welcome, yeah. Sean. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll jump right in a little bit with Sean's background. Okay. Um, Sean, tell me a little bit about yourself and where you went to college. And okay, then... yeah, so um, uh, I went to college at Shelton State, uh, Shelton State Community College at first. It's a two-year in Tuscaloosa, and I went from there to you university. You played basketball, right? I did. I played basketball at Shelton State. Um, for two years, and then I went from there to the University of Alabama, uh, where I did not play basketball, but uh, <laughs> got a degree in exercise science and kinesiology, and went from Alabama to the University of South Alabama in Mobile to get my doctorate in physical therapy. Awesome. <clears throat> so, played two years of college basketball. He was mm -hmm. JUCO Player of the Year. He would not tell you all this, but really, really good basketball player, which kind of set the stage for his athletic career. Very but, relative. Who was around? No, he was really good. Um, so... How did you get into physical therapy? What kind of led you down that path, your interests? Yeah, so uh, I got into physical therapy. I really got very lucky, and um, I ended up shadowing under a true rock star in the profession. Um, he doesn't, he's not even a physical therapist anymore, but um, at the time, he had a great practice. And, uh, but I shadowed him, and he really kind of set me on fire because I'd I'd shadowed a few different physical therapist mm -hmm. and I didn't really care what I saw I didn't really like what I saw I didn't really nothing attracted me to it until I got to him and how he did things I was like this is how I really want to do things yeah so that made me that confirmed to me that this is the route I want to go if I, if I can do things this way that's how I want to do them cool so when did you get into CrossFit and then how did that impact the way you viewed physical therapy so I was my freshman year in physical therapy school a friend of mine Kyle Thibodeau I'll mention him a lot on this show um, he asked me to come do a CrossFit workout with him and at the time I was just buys and tries chest and back I just just whatever <laughs> just just straight up bro sessions all day long and I was strong as an ox but if somebody would have asked me to run a mile I might, might have died <laughs> but uh, so I went to this CrossFit workout with him first CrossFit workout at JH CrossFit in Mobile I think it was overhead squats, toes to bar, and wall balls, and I couldn't do the overhead squats. Most people can't. Yeah, Sorry, I couldn't no. do them. I couldn't do the toes to bar. It was I could do a few of them, and wall balls were just miserable. Yeah. And I realized at that time, also in the same time, we did a strength conditioning camp that had uh, John North, who's one of the greatest Olympic lifters of all time. Oh wow. Uh, had Mike Bergner, had um, the CEO, CEO I think of Exos. Mm. Um, oh, what was the guy's Exos name? Barbell? Nick Winkleman. Um, he was there. Uh, Exos has a barbell division. Yeah. But Exos Sports Performance. And um, those guys are awesome. Bergner asked us to all sit in the bottom of an overhead squat, and I couldn't do it. Hmm. So all those things going into one made me be like, how in the world can I be a better version of what I am now? Because I should be able to do these movements. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of got me into looking into movement a little bit. Cool. cool. And you were already going to be a physical therapist at that Yes, point. that was my first semester in PT school. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. So what led you out of physical therapy school to start your own business because for those of you that don't know Sean graduated PT school when I met him and immediately went into starting his own thing which is mm -hmm. risky and like I think it's it's really incredible so kind of the same reason that I went into physical therapy so I told you when I was shadowing I shadowed a few physical therapists mm -hmm. who I just didn't care for how they did things it wasn't Nothing, it didn't seem like they had any passion about what they did. It didn't seem like what they really did was, was helping someone mm -hmm. until I got a hold of him, the one person, and he showed me, like, we can really change somebody here, and it's a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I wanted to do things. So when I came out, uh, I did uh, internships in PT school. I did about a year and a half worth of uh, clinical rotations, and um, 
really kind of saw the run of the mill way physical therapy was done. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to do that for several reasons, but for one reason, um, I had nerded out so much on strength conditioning. I had nerded out so much on the body and how the body operates and energy systems, things. And I'm in a clinic and I can't use any of it. I'm mm -hmm. seeing four patients every hour at as, the same time as a student. Yeah. So the way it works out, you have like 15 minute increments. So you're overlapping with each patient. And it was just really, it was impossible for me to give them quality because I feel like I had a lot of quality to give them. I had all this knowledge of the body, but I don't have enough time to even think what's going on in the right. day because i am got 40 patients in one day. So would you like give one client something to do and then maybe like a physical therapy assistant work with them and you move on to the next client? Yeah, uh, I couldn't stand using physical therapy assistant, so I tried not to. But, uh, the, and I can guess give you an example of what was the final straw in this for me and what yeah. solidified me doing my own business. So I'm sitting there trying to work with someone while I have another patient beside them. And one of the my fellow PTs in that clinic um, was work. It was rubbing someone's knee and yelling across a 2,000 square foot facility at someone doing wall pulleys, which is you're just moving your shoulders up mm -hmm. and down. He was yelling, "You're doing it wrong. Go the other way." While he's working on someone else, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting there thinking, like, this is just not how I want to do yeah. things at all. People need more of a of a one on one approach. They right. need they need to be treated like people who are injured and human beings that we can help, not right. someone who's just coming in to take up spot. Right. So to follow that up, your business, Vulcan Performance, is a one-to-one -one client to um, coach based program. Mm -hmm. So with it being one-to-one, -one, what does that allow you to do? What does the structure look like? Mm -hmm. Kind of give us like a timeline of the client. Once they come in the door, you know, what does that look like? Yeah. So everybody's different. For sure, but uh, they'll come to the door, and the first thing I want to do, and really this depends on the pathology too, depends on what's going on. So if I have someone, I can elaborate on that a little bit, but if I have someone who comes in and um, they have something going on, I want to hear their story. Unless yeah. their story is something that they don't need to, mm -hmm. to, to stay on, like some low back pain symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, if someone comes in and starts telling me about their low back pain, I may actually cut them off and say, look at this, 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 this. And a little bit later, I will hear their story. Because sometimes you don't want people to focus on what's going on too much before you identify what's going on. But really, doing a one-on-one -on -one practice allows me to hear their full story, where they came from, why are they here, and more importantly, where do they want to be. Mm -hmm. So once I figure out where they want to be, everything that we do in our program after that and physical therapy and our one-on-one -on -one treatment is going to be to get them to where they want to be no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's varying degrees of difficulty. Mm -hmm. But doing a one-on-one -on -one approach and how we do things allows us to really set that up. So are you with well. the client for the entire time? Yes. How long is a time. session? Um, session runs 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, wow, so one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, there was a follow-up question. Oh, how does your background in exercise tie into your approach, or like how does your degree in exercise science Yeah come into play with your physical therapy business? Uh, hand in hand. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in, uh, I'm not as big of a believer in college degrees as I am in someone's, in someone's knowledge and hunger for a subject. I believe we're in a, yeah. in, the, in the world we're in, you can get all the knowledge you want to on a subject from other places just besides college. Right. So, but, but I think my, my hunger and my want for exercise, for just exercise in general, knowing how strength conditioning works and how does the body operate here? How does the body move and do this? Mm -hmm. That is everything in our practice. Our whole practice is movement and strength conditioning. And the reason is because research screams that's what we should be doing. Research mm -hmm. is always advocating for a corrective exercise, for increasing the awareness and the neuro the brain to body connection um, for pretty much any type of pathology. Mm -hmm. And how you increase brain to body connection is through those powerful motor neural pathways. Mm -hmm. So that's how we set up everything is how can we contract? How can I help this contraction along? How can I help the body move how we want it to move to get them closer to where they want to be? Right, but talk a little bit about like on your website, you say we're grounded in principles of strength and conditioning yeah. and I'll send a lot of my friends to you and they love it and they get better really quick, but they're like, I thought I was going to show up and you know, he was going to massage me or <laughs> do something like yeah. that. And then they're like, I was deadlifting mm -hmm. or I was power cleaning. So talk about how that is actually effective yeah. because it really is. People are like, but I got better. Yeah. It's just, they don't expect that they're going to be working out pretty much when they show up. Yeah. So th this, how I love, first off, you have to have a plan with anyone and having a knowledge and strength conditioning lets you put together really a macro cycle, a meso cycle, a micro cycle. Like you can program out 
So if you're, if you're what not, does that mean? What's a micro and macro? Okay, cycle? so, ma- people don't so f- it's basically your plan of treatment. So a macro cycle, if someone comes in with uh, something going on, you say, hey, I think this is our timeline. I think yeah. this could take 12 weeks. Okay, so in 12 weeks, let me break down your journey across 12 weeks on the milestones you should hit. Cool. So, so they know their benchmarks. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about it. So each time cool. I come in, they tell me where they want to be. After they tell me where the, they want to be, we break down what I think the milestone should be for that. So if someone wants to run two miles, well, in four weeks, let's say we should be able to run a 400 meter without any cool. issues. And then eight weeks, 12 weeks, so on, so forth. So there's forth. a very clear path that they There's a clear on. path. We have those milestones we set up. And not only that, but this is something that I feel like is lost in the profession is benchmarks. We test all of this stuff so we know exactly where where we are related to where they want to be. Again, it's all based off where they want to be. Right. But in strength conditioning gives you the knowledge to do that. If you don't know how to do sets and reps, if you don't know how to progress a human body um, along, then I don't know how I don't know how you could ever get someone confidently where they want to be unless yeah. you've methodically planned it out how to do it. Right. We do the programming for each of our clients. So we like you do the programming. For each of our clients. Oh, okay. So before a client comes in, the PT knows exactly what we're trying to do that day. That may hit the fan. Like when they come in, they may say, well, I have all these different things going on and we have to shift, switch gears really fast. Yeah. That's fine. But we have a really good idea of what we should be doing each day. That's awesome. To get us there. Yeah. So talk about also, <laughs> I laugh because I tell all my friends, Sean's not a believer in soft tissue massage, which no. I'm sure you, you do manual work as yeah. well. I know you do. I've seen you do it. But talk about why that is kind of a Band-Aid mm-hmm. and then why you you hinted at the motor neural pathway and like why yeah. did that is more lasting. I am not against soft tissue massage. I'm not against any type of manual work. It has its place. Right. But I think its place in the world of physical therapy is drastically overused. I think it's uh, a lot of places say that we are we are the manual clinic where our basis is manual therapy. And I don't understand why that's such a big deal because research doesn't really advocate for a huge manual approach. It does advocate for smaller approaches in manual. And, and the manual therapy that's really advocated for through the research is any type of manual therapy that allows us to get a better contraction. So how can I manually help someone get a huge muscle contraction to then help us get more functional? Yeah, okay. So you so can't... combining you, it with movement. Yes, combining it with this muscle energy techniques, things of that nature. We combine manual with movement. We do, we do that all the time in the clinic. Right. But much more than us just having 45 minutes of hands-on, we may have... 5, 10, 15 minutes of hands-on where we're trying to help this movement along. And then as soon as we finish that, we're going to move into something of varying degrees of function. Let's increase function as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And something we use every day using a heavy, slow resistance. So heavy, and it means exactly what it says. Let's go as heavy as we can, as slow as possible. And we have numbers that really scientifically put this in place um, to program your body to take movement, to take weight, to take resistance to improve the function overall. So we'll, I'm not against soft tissue at all. Sometimes the power of human touch is unreal. Right. You can touch someone and pain levels go down because pain levels, this is a whole other episode, is not, it's not a A to B connection. It right. is a somatosensory connection. So it's extremely subjective. Right. So touching someone may subjectively help the pain levels overall. But Got yeah. it, cool. So you talk a lot about research and if anyone has walked into your clinic, on the right side, there's a big whiteboard, and it has a really important quote, and I want you to quote it, tell us what that means, and how research mm-hmm. plays into your approach to physical therapy. We aim to create a This world. is what the whiteboard says. This, yeah, this is what the whiteboard <laughs> says, and I actually um, read a book by Simon Sinek, who gave me this idea to put this on the board. Love Simon Sinek. Um, he's, he's amazing. I, um, he wrote the book, Start With Why. He wrote the book, Start With Why, but there was another book he wrote that I, I, I can't remember the name of the book. Oh, 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 The Infinite Game. The Infinite Game. Oh. Infinite Game, yeah. Um, but... He said in the book, you want to say aloud what type of world you want to create hmm. from what you're doing. So our saying is we want to create a, world, create a world in which it is common practice for someone to receive well-researched and up-to-date opinions and actions in healthcare. Hmm. So we, we want people to know, we want a world in which you don't have to worry about the, the opinions or the, what your doctor is telling you to do. We don't have to second guess it. Mm-hmm. which right now where everything is we have to second guess everything you have to get 
third, fourth opinions. And everyone has such different approaches. It's like, is this just their personal opinion? Yes. Or is it backed by research? And there's nothing wrong with different approaches because with the research we have, you can have different approaches using the research. Right. But there is a foundation of really good methodologies and techniques. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to start with is that good foundation of what's proven, what works, and then build on top of philosophically built on top of that through different approaches. Cool. So um, are you constantly just digging into the research and adapting because research constantly changes? We subscribe to a million different newsletter, research newsletters. So I think I've got it kind of honed in to where what's something, um, if something goes on with, uh, with low back pain, all of a sudden I get any article that has that word in there, we get it and we kind of peruse it and see what's going mm. on. Um, but yeah, so we're always at least two or three times a week, we're diving into the research. In fact, Wednesday mornings, I have a two hour segment in the morning to where all I'm doing is researching different topics cool. of what's going on. So we, we try to stay really researched up. And again, we follow a million different people who yeah. are putting great research out there, whether it be online or Instagram. You can get some great information yeah. from certain people on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, learn a lot yeah. from other people. Um, okay, cool. Can you talk about the different branches of Vulcan performance yeah. and how um, the impetus for each one of them. What yeah. can I get it started? So Vulcan performance, when we started it, um, I'm, I'm not a fan of labels at all. I'm not a fan of, of someone having ploy in a field simply because they have a degree in something. Yeah. I want, I, I don't feel like a degree really should give you much in our day and time. Maybe it did in the past, but where we are now, I want to know, um, what a person knows about a topic. How they got that information, that can be in a whole other conversation for another day, but is someone following the research and what do they know about their branch? What do they know about what they're doing? Are they, are they putting out the correct stuff for mm -hmm. people to, to really help people? So all of Vulcan Performance was created with that in mind. I have a degree, I have a doctorate of physical therapy, have CSCS, USAW, yeah, across all these different things. So I've got the labels to allow me to say I don't believe in labels. Yeah. Um, but so Vulcan Performance was set up trying to be a healthcare group for people to be treated correctly in healthcare. I don't believe a lot of times in the healthcare system we have right now, people are treated like they should be. So how did that lead into like master's performance? Yeah, so... Um, and like talk about what master's is. Yeah, so we set up Vulcan performance to do physical therapy the right way, right. essentially. So as I was working into that, all a lot of the research I was doing was on older adults. So I kept on coming across older adults and yeah. seeing that this is the most researched population in the world is geriatrics, mm -hmm. but it's the it's it's the least implemented. Mm -hmm. We have all this research, but nobody's using it because it's not exactly the most you know the most exciting field geriatrics. Right. Like nobody, I'm gonna be a geriatric like geriatric doctor. Like it's right. not the most exciting field. To me, it's super exciting now that I've dove into the research and I see, man, we can change someone's life, right? And we can change someone's death. Like that's really powerful when you can change how someone finishes out their life hmm. um, in, a, in a really positive way or a negative way. But we set it up. We set up mass performance, and for those of you who don't know, mass performance is our way of doing fitness for the older adult. Heavily research-based, a lot of good research we can talk about someday on the podcast yeah. of how we can, um, we don't, with through mass performance, we're not really extending life. What research is saying, we may be able to extend life by a year or two, but what we're doing is we're adding quality hmm. until the end of life. Right. Instead of this slow decline for, for three or four years in an assisted living or in a hospital yeah. and then you die and your family goes through all this stuff. And in Birmingham, it costs $200,000 a year to go into an assisted living. Right. So you have, and the average stay in assisted living is 3.8 years. Right. So and two, four, six, I mean, you're looking there. at $750,000 that the family has to pay. You liquefy your home, you lose all these assets. No, through our research, research that other people have done that we're using, we know that we can keep you functional and independent up until the point of death. Mm -hmm. Yes, you'll have some time to where a few weeks in the hospital, some time where life dwindles, but when it's time to die, you die. Right. We, extend it, we extend it a little bit, and I think that's powerful. Nobody wants to go out with a slow with a slow way. You want to live life how you want to live, and then it's time to exit. Yeah, so we'll do a whole podcast on master's performance because mm -hmm. it's absolutely fascinating and I think you're doing incredible work there with research yeah. that is not implemented through jazzercise or YMCA older adult classes and like, not to like dog any of these programs. Yeah, it's great, yeah. to, great to get people moving however it might be, but your approach to strength and conditioning for the older adult is, is absolutely fascinating. So we'll do a whole podcast on that. And then another division is what you're doing to Vulcan Nutrition and it falls exactly into what we're trying to do is is proactively attack healthcare and and from the very beginning put people in better situations to live 
to enhance what moves you. Yeah. That's what we do to live the lives they want to live, be able to do what they want to do without the hindrances of, really the hindrances we're combating are chronic disease. Right. So we want to change that. We want to, to through the different divisions of our company, um, to help people. That's our 100% goal is if we can help people, then our business will do well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so you also have, you have Vulcan Nutrition, you have Master's Performance, you mm -hmm. have your physical therapy side. You also have some other offerings like blood flow restriction. Is that right? Oh, yeah. So we do. We actually have blood flow restriction cuffs on site. We rent those out to folks. Um, every, anything in blood flow restriction is just an example. Um, but, we'll have to uh, do a whole podcast on that. Oh, yeah. Too and I have a, a guest speaker I really want to get for that because he is the man in blood flow restriction. I learned everything I know from him. Um, oh. But uh, blood flow restriction, we offer it because it's so proven. We have 30 years of incredible research behind blood flow restriction. It's probably the most mind blowing thing yeah. to come up in strength conditioning or rehab in the past decade. Yeah. So we have all this research behind it, but nobody does it because it's brutal. And you've done it. You know how tough I cried. it is. It's, it's brutal. And we you probably cried because we didn't have it zoned in right. I was still learning. Yeah, how to no, use this I stuff. was just, yeah. Um, but candy. blood flow restriction is incredible. And that's just an offering we do. We don't offer things that I don't believe are beneficial. Yeah. So everything we do is something positive that has great research behind it. Cool. So we've like we get the pair of Normatec boots that sit in the corner of the clinic and collect dust because we bought them a long time ago and there's not any really research behind it. But hey, they feel really good. Yeah, so they do feel good. So you have some stuff. Yeah, if somebody wants to hop in them and after their session, yeah, they want to hop in them and just relax, go for it. But yeah. I'm not going to sit here and promote something like that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so there's a lot more we can talk about. We need to do specific episodes on all this stuff, but. Mm -hmm. Talk about your vision for the clinic and what you hope you can do through all of these branches of Vulcan and yeah. how, enhancing people's lives. Man, my vision for the clinic is I want to be the catalyst that starts a change in healthcare. And I have my little world of physical therapy, my mm -hmm. tiny little corner in the healthcare niche. And physical therapists aren't exactly looked on with a whole lot of, with a whole lot of ploy and a whole lot of respect. Mm -hmm. um, but it's my starting point. It's where we can start. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if we can change the way people view healthcare, change the way people go about healthcare, it change that mindset from my first steps into healthcare is my first steps into a physician's office or a doctor's office. Our first steps in the healthcare need to be working out sometime, somehow in a gym, something to where our nutrition based, something much more foundational mm -hmm. than reactive as a doctor's office. Yeah. Um, so I want to use my vision for the clinic is somehow touching on this and starting that revolution of changing healthcare from reactive to proactive. Mm -hmm. That's overall, that's all encompassing, whether that be through physical therapy or um, a medical doctor, whatever that ends up being, that's our vision. Overall, awesome. I love yeah. it. Um, I have a like two more questions I want to ask, but in terms of like if someone's listening and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm hurt right now. Like, how do I initiate this process of mm -hmm. maybe like going to see you or even just getting like hearing more about you, like an yeah. initial assessment? Like, what does that look like as far as um, doctors stuff goes? Yeah, go to our website, VulcanMovement.com. Um, go to www.VulcanMovement.com and click your book your one-on-one -on -one appointment, and we'll take care of everything from there. If you need so a doctor, so they don't need a doctor's excuse before they book an appointment. No, the first time you can you see us uh, in the state of Alabama, we can see someone for an initial evaluation without a doctor's referral. Okay. So um, in a lot of states, in 48 other states, we can see you for 14 visits without a doctor's <laughs> referral. But Alabama is just the last one coming. Hopefully We're behind be, on everything. Hopefully it'll be this year and we get that. But yeah, we can see you without a doctor's referral. Um, but if you fill out that appointment card, we'll kind of walk you through what needs to be done. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So questions that we're going to ask everyone we have on this podcast, what is one thing that you are doing that you've recently started implementing that has had the biggest impact on your health? This is a question we got from Julie Fouché in Pursuing Health. Uh huh. The biggest impact on my health, and it's going to be funny, um, is resting. And this is something that <laughs> I've preached delo weeks and rest days and all this other stuff and i've always been the person to i want to work out all the time so uh i've found so much more when forcing myself to take a rest day every week and maybe two rest days every week mm -hmm. uh i think that's been huge for me and i've seen a lot of my basic numbers 
like back squat and things of that nature go up simply because I have forced myself to rest a little bit more. Mm. And I've always taken a day off each week, but I think I'm just a person genetically that requires a little bit more rest. Mm. So I've started uh, trying to rest just a little well, bit six more. Six out of seven days is a lot. Yeah, that's too much. It's too much. And I've always known that. I've been a poor implementer of mm. taking my own advice and not resting as much. And even going through a deload week every now and then. Like mm-hmm. like every, every eight weeks, try to go through a deload week where you don't do things as intensely. Right. I'm going to try to do that. We uh, need a podcast on deload week and how that. Oh, yeah. We yeah. can talk about a lot of that. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. And then what is one thing that you're not doing that you should be doing that would have the biggest impact on your health? <sighs> biggest impact on my health. One thing. I, uh, uh, the biggest impact on my health. Hmm. I sh- There's a lot of little things that come to mind. For instance, I probably should work on decreasing my coffee intake. I think I drink entirely too much coffee. <laughs> um, but uh, probably nutrition. And um, that's something that you and I talk about a lot, but uh, I really would love to. And I've done it before. I've I've had my nutrition really um, honed in. And I know it's different for each person of how honed in nutrition needs to be and what your thought process is. Um, I've done really well in the past where I have it pretty honed in. My macros are really – so we – and you've set this up for me is those kind of exact macro numbers that you tell people not to fixate on, but I like to see me hit those macros yeah. all the time. But have that dialed in and then from that foundation, switch it up and change around, add a lot more protein in or do this and really kind of play around with some of those things. I t- tend to do really well performance-wise when I'm yeah. doing that stuff. So I'd really like to get back to doing that. Yeah. And it's January 1st, so why not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's fine now. Cool. So, anything else you want to add? Like, where uh, well, where else can people find you? Uh, yeah, you can find um, us on Instagram at Vulcan Movement um, for Facebook and Instagram, and my personal is at Sean Hiller Physio. Mm-hmm. Um, and on, where is your clinic located? On Instagram, we are located in Mountain Brook, uh, right by the post office in Mountain Brook. Awesome. Uh, yep, right by Crystal Village. Cool. Mm-hmm. Well. We have a lot of follow-up episodes we can do on this, but thanks for telling us about your content. No, this is awesome. I'm excited about this. Yeah, thank you all for listening. Thanks, guys.